Hello everybody and welcome to Blockchain Expert. In this video, I'll be going over proof of stake. Now proof of stake is an alternative consensus algorithm to proof of work that's meant to address some of the concerns and environmental impact with proof of work. Now as we talked about in the previous video, proof of work is a good algorithm. It does work, it's been battle tested, it's been around for a very long time, but it's extremely wasteful when it comes to the amount of compute power that's being used that doesn't actually contribute to the security of the network. So proof of stake is an alternative mechanism that uses much less energy, about 99% less energy than proof of work, and is meant to decentralize the network further and allow more people access to become validators. So I'm going to start going through some of the terminology here because you'll notice that some of the words are a little bit different with proof of stake. So with proof of work, we had miners and we were mining. Now the miners were the computers on the network that were attempting to guess the nonce and provide the proof of work for a block. Now when they did that, they mined the block because they received a reward. They were essentially mining new cryptocurrency out of that block and they got some type of block reward. Now, on a proof of stake network, at least if we're talking about, for example, what the Ethereum proof of stake network will be very shortly as I'm filming this video, uh, what happens is we call these miners validators. So rather than miners, we have validators. And rather than mining a block, we are minting or we are forging a new block. So just keep that in mind because I'm going to start using that new terminology here. No longer do we talk about miners, we talk about validators. Now, with proof of stake, Rather than having compute power and having graphics cards and large mining farms, which we talked about before, rather you have a relatively simple computer, something that doesn't have to have high computational power, but what allows you access to validate nodes or validate block story on the network is a stake that you provide. So let me start drawing out a diagram here. Let's say that these are all of our validators. So again, similar to miners, but we're calling them validators. Now in a proof of work consensus algorithm, these miners would have to be powerful computers or computers with at least a minimum amount of power that were hashing. They were guessing numbers very, very fast. And these computers would all be guessing numbers at the exact same time. Meanwhile, only one or two of these computers would ever be submitting a valid block at the same time. And so we'd be wasting a ton of resources. Now, in a proof of stake algorithm, what happens is all of these validators actually put up stake. And this stake is in the form of the native token for the network. So if we're referring to something like Ethereum, they all put up a certain amount of F. Now, the amount of F that they put up is what allows them access to validate different blocks. Now, this F is their stake. It's also referred to as their collateral. Now, if they are to do something bad on the network, they are to validate transactions that are invalid, then that means that they would lose their stake. Their stake would become slashed. So that's the basic idea here is rather than having high computational power and a ton of wasted um, guesses, essentially a ton of wasted energy, we have validators on the network that provide some stake. These validators are actually going to randomly be selected based on the portion of stake that they put up. And if they are performing well, they will receive the reward from the block that they mint or forge. If they are performing poorly or I guess, uh, what would you call this, incorrectly, maliciously, etc., they validate transactions that should not be validated, then they will lose part of their stake and it will be slashed. So their incentive to provide valid validations or to validate correctly is that they have stake. And if they don't do that, then they will lose part of their stake. So it's actually a financial penalty if they are to uh, act poorly or perform malicious actions on the network. So that's a high level overview of ETH. So that's the high level overview of proof of stake. And now let's dig in a little bit more about how exactly this works. All right, so I'm just going to draw out a few validators here and we'll go through a more detailed example of exactly how this works. So let's say that we have six validators on our network. Now, all of these validators must provide some form of stake. Now, the stake is going to be in the native token of the network. And I'm just going to use the Ethereum proof of stake uh, example, or I guess network as an example as we go through this video. So the minimum stake actually that's proposed by the proof of stake algorithm for Ethereum is 32 Ethereum. Now, this is actually a significant amount if you equate this to say US dollars, obviously depends on the price of Ethereum, but I believe right now it'd be about 40,000 US dollars that you'd have to put up if you wanted to become a validator on the network. So even though this is meant to make it easier for people to become validators, there is a large financial um, kind of barrier to entry here. Now, there is ways to pool stake and to have kind of staking pools, which we can get into later. But for now, we'll just imagine the minimum stake is 32 
Ethereum. So in this example, we have 192 Ethereum total. Now, what's going to happen is when a new block needs to be created, one of these validators will be randomly selected based on the proportion of stake that they have. So in this case, all of our validators are holding one sixth of the stake uh, in total that's on the network. So they have approximately a one in six chance of being selected. However, if this validator here were to have 64, their chance would increase. And I believe that's going to be a two in seven chance, whereas the rest would have a one in six. So that is what would happen if you increase the stake. So let's say for the example purpose here that this is just 32 and that this validator is actually selected to create this new block. So it gets randomly selected by the network. Again, the way it's going to get selected is based on how much stake it's putting up. And then in this case, it just creates a block. So it's going to create a block using the transaction pool that it's going to be storing, similar to what our miners would have. And all it actually needs to do to create the block is to fill in all of the data that's required and to validate each of the individual transactions. Now, once it does that, there's no need to provide any proof of work. It doesn't need to guess a nonce. It just simply submits this block to the other validators. So now the rest of the validators, what their job is, is essentially to look at this newly created block and to just check off and say, yes, this block looks good to me. Now, so long as a majority of the validators agree that this block is valid, it will be added onto the blockchain and will continue from there. So now it gets added to the blockchain. Assuming that it was valid, what will happen is this validator will receive a reward. Now, that reward, again, is going to be based on the transaction fees. And actually, this is an important distinction here. The rewards that you receive are only the sum of the transaction fees. There is no block reward. Now, on some proof of stake algorithms, there may be or some proof of stake networks. But on the Ethereum proof of stake network, which again should be coming sometime later this year at the time that I'm filming this video, you're only receiving the transaction fees. You are not receiving any type of block reward. So that would mean that no new Ethereum is being created. You are simply getting transaction fees from existing Ethereum. So continuing here, the scenario we just looked at is one in which all of these validators agree that this block is valid, or at least a majority of them do. Now, that's great. This just means this block gets added just like any other block would get added to the network. And then the process repeats. A new validator is randomly selected and we continue from there. However, what happens if this is an invalid block? Well, if it is an invalid block, that means a majority of the validators disagreed and said, no, this is not valid. Your transactions are not valid inside of this block. And that would mean that this validator here would have a portion of its stake slashed. Now, I won't talk about exactly how the portion is determined, whether it's one Ethereum, all of the Ethereum, etc. But essentially, they are going to lose more Ethereum than they would have gained when they uh, get a reward from this block. Now, as long as that condition is met, that they're going to be losing more money than they gain when they do something incorrectly or fraudulently, then that encourages people to perform well and to be good actors on the network. So again, that's what would happen. They would lose part of their stake and how they lose it depends on many different factors and how much they lose. Same thing depends on a lot of different factors. Usually it's not going to be the entire stake, but again, it depends on kind of the action that they did and how fraudulent they were behaving. All right. So at this point in time, you should have a decent understanding of how proof of stake works. It's actually fairly simple compared to proof of work. You put up some stake. That is your collateral. If you perform poorly or you do something wrong, that stake gets removed. And based on the amount of stake you have, you get randomly selected to validate the next block. That's really how proof of stake works. Now, the main advantage of proof of stake is the environmental impact. It reduces it by about 99%. However, there is some disadvantages and some things to be aware of with proof of stake. So if we're talking about a network like Ethereum, which should shortly be moving over to proof of stake. Currently, it is proof of work. It has a market cap today as of filming this video on what is this August 12th of 2022 of two hundred and thirty billion dollars. Now, if you wanted to control 50 percent of the network, you would need to have access to one hundred and fifteen billion dollars worth of Ethereum, be staking that Ethereum and have that set up in different validators. Now, you could actually, I guess, just have one validator that was staking one hundred and fifteen billion dollars. But still, it's a little bit more complicated than it seems. So in this situation, some of you may be saying, well, that actually seems doable, right, to obtain one hundred fifteen billion dollars. Now, maybe that's the case. I'm not too sure about how difficult it is to acquire one hundred and fifteen billion dollars in liquid Ethereum assets, uh, but it is a pretty massive number. So you'd have to have large financial ability 
to control the Ethereum network. And you'd have to have half the network essentially willing to sell you coins uh, and be able to buy half the circulating supply of Ethereum, which to me seems pretty difficult to do. So I just wanted to mention that if you wanted to control half the Ethereum network, which is going to be a proof of stake network soon, you'd have to have $115 billion in Ethereum and be staking that Ethereum. So continuing beyond that, the idea of proof of stake is that not only it reduces the energy impact, it should increase decentralization. Now, the idea behind that is that anyone can set up a validator without being extremely technical and without having high end computer hardware. The issue, though, is the minimum stake, right? of 32 Ethereum. Now, the reason that stake is so high is to really incentivize the behavior to be correct, because you can lose a lot of money if you are not behaving properly on the network. But it does kind of increase the barrier to entry, especially for people that wouldn't have, say, 40,000 US dollars at the time of filming this video. Now, you can pool your stake, right? So if a bunch of us all had one Ethereum and there was 32 of us, we could all pool that together to become one validator and then just split the rewards that were generated by that validator. So in that case, you wouldn't necessarily be increasing decentralization because a lot of people would be pooling stakes. However, if you get to the point where you have 32 Ethereum, you're not necessarily inclined to want to pool this with other people. You might just want to set up your own validator so that you have the chance of being selected based on that stake. Now, another thing that proof of stake does is it should hopefully make Ethereum become more of a deflationary asset and really not just Ethereum, pretty well any other network that implements this. Now, the reasoning behind that is that when you implement a proof of stake algorithm, many people are going to be essentially locking their Ethereum or locking their coin away and not using it, not selling it. So the more coin that's taken out of regular circulation off of trading platforms, etc., should make it more difficult to obtain Ethereum. And this should hopefully in turn increase the price of Ethereum because it would be more difficult to obtain it because there's less in regular circulating supply. All right, so that wraps up a majority of what I wanted to mention in this video. I will just quickly add one more thing here without getting too complex into proof of stake, that when you have multiple validators, as we already know, they're selected based on the proportion of stake that they provide. However, that cannot be the only way that we select validators, because that could mean the same validator was constantly getting selected if they had a massive majority of the stake. So there is a few other factors that are put into this. I won't really list them here or get into them, but just understand there's a few more things other than simply the amount of stake that determine which validators are going to be chosen. And one other thing I will mention here, there is scenarios where a validator could be chosen, but not actually be online, not be available to validate. And in that case, we would have had to have, say, a backup validator or multiple backup validators that we would then go to so that they can validate the block. And we're not, uh, what do you call it here, kind of stalling or having the network be hung up because a specific validator is not available to validate. So with that said, I will wrap up the video here. I hope this was a good introduction to proof of stake and contrasted some of the differences between this and proof of work. I hope you enjoyed the video and I look forward to seeing you in another blockchain expert video.